So I was asked to read the scripture for this evening, and I thought, I'd better read it over first, and so I did in English, and I thought, should I read it in Hebrew? I read the first verse to myself, that was just bad enough, so you're going to get it in English. <laughs> Genesis 37, 1 through 8. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhadzim by his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. You're going to have the special privilege of having Brother Rufus Myers present the message. I think he graduated about 11 or 12 years ago. Um, Rufus has been a joy to be with, and as Katie and Dorothy and the simple teachings folks will attest, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so, but, and, I, and I've, I've been with Rufus and attending the service for like uh, 11 years. And I can, and I've told him this, his sermons have just been super good lately. He's just right on. So, uh, would you please welcome Brother Rufus Myers to speak to you? First of all, I want to say good evening to everyone. Good evening. I uh, was told that. I'm limited on time. So, just so you know, we won't be here longer than two and a half hours. <laughs> no, we need it up very long. I want to take a, a moment to say thank you to David Krogh and Dr. Joe Martin for inviting me to be the speaker here tonight. Uh, when they asked me would I be the speaker, I said, yes. I said, wow, you guys really have come down in the world. But nevertheless, I am here. And I asked God for a word like I always do, and he gave me one too. Matter of fact, I had preached on it a while ago. That's going to be the problem here tonight, Dustin. I have a problem differentiating between preaching and speaking. If I begin to preach, then we're going to be here for a while. I'm sure you guys don't have anything else to do, so that's good. But tonight, I would like to talk to the graduating class and those of you in the audience about something I believe is going to make the biggest difference in your life. I truly believe that. And that is follow your dream. Follow your dream. Uh, Bob just read the scripture and if you are familiar with Joseph and the Bible and the book of Genesis, then you will know what the story is all about. It is about a young man who uh, was given some dreams and they were 
inspirational, to say the least. Dreams can make you feel pretty good. I'm not talking about nightmares, I'm talking about dreams. Dreams, uh, those dreams that uh, put you in some type of higher position uh, can make you feel pretty good. And this is what Joseph experienced. He believed that he was going to rule over his family and everybody else. Now mind you now, he was only 17 years old. He was working in the field. He was down here, and his dream told him he was going to be here. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight for the next two and a half hours. <laughs> dreams. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I had to look up dreams so that I could make sure that uh, I was right on point. Uh, and so Webster said that dreams are Successions of images, ideals, emotions, and sensations that occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. Dreams can at times make a creative thought occur in, uh, to the person or give a sense of inspiration. Dreams can have varying natures such as frightening, Exciting or sexual, which I would not elaborate on. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I believe it's God's way of communicating with us, encouraging or giving us direction. Amen. Somebody, you can say amen tonight. Amen. I can't hear you. Say amen. 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 It is God's way, I believe, of communicating with us. Because if you think about it, most of us are so busy while we are awake in that period of time that we don't take time to listen to God. And so God says, okay, I'm going to communicate with you while you are asleep. Yeah, yeah, you don't have a choice but to listen. Amen. And so this is where the story begins. I believe that God put this topic in my spirit because of what I am also going through myself. And when I talk with people, it seems like they're also dealing with certain issues in their lives as well. You said, what does that have to do with dreams? Well, thank you for asking. I'll tell you. As you go through life, when you leave this secure place, these four walls, reality is going to hit. You're looking kind of crazy right now, but, but I just want you to be aware of what's going to happen. Reality is going to happen. Nobody's going to wake you up and say, it's time to go to class. You're going to be in the real world. And when you're in the real world, you can ask your parents. They, they've been holding off on telling you the story, but it's kind of difficult. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? Life will come after you with a bang. And so this is why it is so important, I believe, for you to hold on to your dream. If you don't have any dreams, you better start asking God for a dream. I mean a good dream. Because it is that dream that is going to help you to get through life. Have you ever gone on a vacation before? If you haven't, you need to. But when we go on vacation, my family and I, we have a great time. We go to the beach usually. We, you know, the kids are growing up now. Uh, we just have a fun time shopping, eating, you know, until we can't eat anymore. You know what I mean, right? Amen. 
And, 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 and so when the vacation is over, we get back to what I always say around the hustle and bustle. Mike, you can say amen at some point in time. Thank you. We get back to the hustle and bustle. And a lot of times, Brother Julius, the hustle and bustle can get the best of us. And I believe it is those dreams that is going to help these folks to keep going. Amen. To not give up. To not give in. For you to take a moment and think and reflect on your dream that I believe God gave to you. From my own experience, when reviewing my dreams, I realized uh, that it is uh, something that I cannot do alone. I usually find myself in a positive or powerful position with no indication how I arrived there. Thus believing that God is showing me pieces of my future. Based on what I read in the Bible pertaining to Joseph and Genesis, I'm not too far off. I believe dreams are pieces of our future. I, I, I do. I, I believe it's, it, it is something that God is showing us uh, what we're going to be. Uh, it's going to seem crazy. Uh, the, the dream is not going to even seem real. Some of you know what we're talking about, right? I mean, some of you have uh, 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 had dreams that you were a millionaire, hit the lottery. Oh, don't act like you don't play. But anyway, you, you had dreams that you, you won something or you were some big wig somewhere. And then when you woke up, you looked around and did not see anything resembling that dream. Can I get an Amen. amen. Dreams are going to be unreal. They're going to also seem unattainable. And they're supposed to be unattainable. That's why they're dreams. But also, I believe that the reason why they are unattainable or seem that way is because God is saying, it's not you that's going to get there by yourself. It is me who's going to help you. Amen. Yeah, you're in Bible college. You, you, you graduated from Atlanta Bible College. We, we, we believe in God. We, we believe in, in, in faith. We, we, we should be walking by faith and not by sight. See, when you start walking by sight, you in trouble. Because when we walk by sight, we begin to see everything right before our eyes. We see a bank account that has a bunch of alphabets saying NSF. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I don't walk by sight. I don't want to see that. <laughs> I want to walk by faith. Dreams are the things that motivate you when life is trying to tear you down. Dreams are the things that make you happy and smile when everything around you seems to be crumbling down. I believe that our dream is God's way of relieving us from the pressures of our daily life. I, I truly believe that. I believe that the reason why you dream those good dreams of success is because God is trying to help you to deal with life itself. Because in life, things just don't always go the way we plan. I love the scripture when it says, many of the plans of a man's heart. But, there's that conjunction, it is God's plans that ultimately prevail. Amen. And so this is why we must have dreams. This is why we must follow our dreams no matter what. We must not give in to the pressures of this world. I love what Jeremiah 29 11 says. 
It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. God wants only the best for his people. Amen. This is why you cannot walk by sight. Because walking by sight, you're not going to see the very best. Joseph did not see, amen somebody, amen. the very best when he was walking by sight. What he saw was this. What he saw was his brothers hating him. Amen. His brothers wanted to kill him. Okay, help me out. His brothers selling him into slavery. See, see, this is what I believe kept him going. He remembered the dream. He's a servant. He's been lied on. He's been put in jail and forgotten. But he did not forget about his dream. He did not give up on his dream. I believe it is the dream that he had that helped him to endure until the end. It is that dream that you must have. That's going to get you through life. I do not know what you're going to experience in life. But I do know this one thing. You will experience something. And it will not always be pleasant. Follow your dream. In order for you to follow your dream, you must be focused on your dream. Yes. You must be focused on your dream. I believe each of you have some type of dream. I, I believe there's some goal somewhere set in your mind. If not, you need to implant one tonight. So you can focus on that dream. So you can work toward that dream. You might want to go on and get your master's. Go on and get your PhD. You need to put it on paper so you can see it and so you can work toward that thing. Because as sure as I'm speaking to you tonight, there are going to be obstacles that come in your life that's going to try to deter you or distract you from obtaining your goal or your dream. And so you must have your dream and your goal written down so you can see that thing every day. You need to be inspired every day to accomplish that goal or that dream. I'm almost done. I think every preacher says that. Amen. <laughs> we got another hour and a half to go. <laughs> In order for you to follow your dream and not abandon them, there are three things that I believe that you must do. First, you must believe in your dream. That's the first thing. You must believe in your dream. As I said before, God gives us dreams and, and sometimes they seem unachievable or unattainable at that time in your life. You must believe in your dream no matter how far-fetched it seems. Dreams give us hope. I always like to say, if you don't see yourself as doing what you want to do, you won't see yourself doing what you want to do. You've got to see yourself in that position, whatever it is, before it happens. and yet believes. Yeah. 
I know I'm not talking on your head because you studied this. And I'm going to say something that I believe is going to mess some of your psyche up. <laughs> Whatever it is that you want to do in life, you need to start praising and thanking God right now for him making that thing happen in your life. Speak to those things that are not as if they are. You got to believe in your dreams. Because you saw Joseph, all the stuff he went through. If he had not believed in his dream, I believe he would have stayed in that prison. But he believed in that dream. You know how I know? If you read the story, you'll see. He told those guys, uh, uh, the one who actually got out of prison, who worked for the king, he said, look, remember me. When you get out, remember me. I believe he was thinking about that dream, thinking that, you know what? There's no way I'm going to get to my dream in this prison. Believe in your dream. See yourself in that position. The second thing that you must do in order to follow your dream is you must overcome fear. Usually at the time of your dream, uh, you will probably lack the resources and knowledge to make your dream a reality or for it to be manifested in your life. I told you it's going to, the dream is going to be kind of outrageous. And when you start thinking about that dream, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Fear will immediately appear. Some of you have, or all of you, I hope, have taken exams to get you to where you are now. And you remember those days when you didn't really study like you should have. <laughs> and you remember how you felt the final exam of the midterm? Fear was grasping at you. You probably prayed more than you ever have in your life. <laughs> Taking that test every time you wrote heaven and father, I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. <laughs> Fear is always going to be there. That's the trick of the enemy. I like what 2 Timothy said in 1 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I tell the story at church about how uh, we went on vacation uh, maybe a year or two ago and we uh, uh, went to Bush Gardens in, in Florida and, and, and I was always afraid of roller coasters and, and so I said to my family, this is it. I will not fear roller coasters anymore. I rebuke the roller coasters in Jesus. <laughs> I can tell you right now, fear was coming out of me and it was coming into my family. They were like, oh my God. I picked the biggest roller coaster that was in the park. We're going to ride on that monster today. My wife tried to console me, honey, it's okay. Calm down, we don't have to ride on it today. I said, we're getting on a roller coaster today. And we're getting on the biggest one that they have. I'm going to overcome my fear today. I'm going to face it head on. And I think they began to pray <laughs> sincerely. The fervent and effectual prayers of the righteous prevail as much. They prayed hard. I believe I saw blood coming out of their skin. God answered their prayers. It stormed. <laughs> they made an announcement and said, we're closing the park now. I kid you not. My family was so happy. Thank you, Jesus. Well, the next day, I 
had calmed down. <laughs> I said, we're still going to ride a roller coaster. But we chose a small one. <laughs> but fear, we must overcome our fear. You said fear of what? Fear of failure. Fear of failure. Failure will hold you back every time. I'm in sales and, and so there's a sense, of, there's always a little fear there. You won't see it because I won't show it. And it won't last long. Because rejection comes along with, that's what brings about fear. When people tell me no, that doesn't mean anything to me. I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going to get this product in their hands, whether they want to or not. You are going to have to be determined to succeed. There are going to be many days when you're going to want to give up. When you've been told, no, we're not going to allow you in here. When you're going to be told, no, we don't need another preacher in this church. No, you will not get into this college or university. No, we don't need another youth pastor. You cannot give up. You got to keep going. You got to look at that dream and say, you know what? God showed me this. He told me this is what I'm going to be. And you must continue on until someone says yes. Overcome your fear. The last thing I want to talk about is, I believe the most important, be patient. Be patient. In this microwave society, we don't know what that word means anymore. There's my beautiful wife over there in the corner. Hi, honey. Hi. She still hadn't realized what that square thing in the kitchen is. That big thing that sits on the floor called an oven. Everything she cooks goes in the microwave. Honey, you gonna cook a Thanksgiving turkey this year? Let me see what it's in the microwave. <laughs> Could you make some mashed potatoes? Sure. Let me put it in the microwave. In this fast-paced society that we in, we don't have time for patience. Because you want it now? Amen. See, you see other people who have it now. And so you want it now too. That's going to be in your mind. I want it now. I'm going after it. I'm going to get it now. And I'm going to tell you right now, it ain't going to happen now. He better go speak to you. You must be patient. The best example I can give you of patience is this. Not Joseph. He was a good guy. He, that was a patience that was involuntary. When you locked up, that's involuntary. You didn't actually be locked up. I'm going to talk about David for a moment. Everybody likes to talk about David and Goliath, how he defeated Goliath. What you don't talk about and what you don't see is the patience that he had. He was a shepherd boy. He was watching the sheep, the sheep and he was, he was taking care of them, defending them from animals with a slingshot. See, what you don't think about 
about when you talk about David's this, you don't realize he was in that field for years practicing with that slingshot. I can see David now. I'm going to hit that leaf on that tree back there. And he was working for years until he perfected that slingshot. And so when the time came, when God finally elevated him to authority, he was prepared. And thus the story, David and Goliath. David hit that giant right where he needed to hit it. Right where he was exposed. That took precision. That was training. That, my friend, was patience. You're going to have to be patient. It's not going to happen right now. It took Joseph 13 years before he actually obtained his dream that God showed him. 13 years. This is day one for you. Good luck. You must be patient. If you're not patient, then what's going to happen is this. You're going to become anxious. And what does the Bible say about being anxious? Be anxious for nothing. Do you know why it says that? Because when we're anxious, we start doing things that are irrational. We start running red lights because we don't want to wait. Don't act like you had dinner. <laughs> the camera saw you. <coughs> we make coffee and don't put a cup on it in the kitchen. <laughs> I did that the other day. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Coffee was everywhere but in a cup. <laughs> patience. We must not be anxious. You must be patient. Take your time. Go through your training. Be mentored. Continue your learning. It's going to happen. Just not right now. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. As I get ready to close, I said that one time. <laughs> I'm reminded of this scripture. This is the last scripture. The race is not given to the swift, but to the one who endureth until the end. You're going to get there. Jesus ain't coming back yet. He's coming, but he's going to give you time to get there. You're not going to be able to save everybody. Be patient. You're going to feel much better. You're going to sleep much better at night. You will. You won't have to take tongues like me. Yes, I have a bottle of them by my bed. They keep me confident. At <laughs> Follow your dreams. Thank you. their certificates and diplomas. I'm reminded, I tend to admire those this. I attended a bunch of schools in my life. One of them was Arizona State. I, 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 I won't even say how many schools I graduated from, but I did not participate in the graduation of any of the secular schools. 
I only uh, participated at Oregon Bible College, Fuller Seminary in Columbia. I didn't think those other schools, for some reason, were real schools. You know, at Oregon Bible College, we had a very small number. But if you remember 2 Corinthians 12, God is looking for the least because, and the last, because in your weakness, then he's strong. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got a, a great group of young people here tonight, and they will be blessed. We're going to present the foundation certificates, and Gary and Anthony, Anthony are going to present those. The foundation certificate is 30 semester hours of Bible ministry and general education. And our first person is Jesse Allen. Right. Jesse preached his first sermon in the chapel, official first sermon, I guess. And that is now on the internet in the Atlanta Bible College preaching. Uh, yeah, check him out. Uh, next is Nathan Massey from Lawrenceville, Ohio. All right. Nathan is a very funny guy. <laughs> we drove all the way to Louisiana on a, a youth trip, and everyone else was asleep, and he kept me in the stitches just laughing at his <laughs> corny jokes. Thank you, Nathan. And the next one is Jacob Rohr from Lawrenceville, also. All right. And now we're going to do the associate. The associate is 60 semester hours, and the person who's getting this is way ahead of that, but we got to go back. And so we, uh, and she is our favorite student from Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> We would have her give her a speech, but Krista, her mom, is here. And she might be crying all the way through. So. Um, and now for the uh, the main degree, the, the bachelor's degree, uh, Gary and David will present those. We have three super guys, really, three super guys that are just phenomenal students. Um, and they all start with Jack. <laughs> Jack, John, and Julius. And the first one that we're going to have come up is Jackson Andrew Commit. If you will notice, all three of these guys have a, a gold cord, and that represents they had a 3.0 or better average. Wow. So all right. And brother John Obi. John. John and I both have Honda Odysseys with over 300,000 miles. <laughs> We know how to take care of cars, especially <laughs> as a student and a poor professor. <laughs> John, God bless you and your family, all the, that you're here. And Brother Julius Ross. All right, here we go. Julius has written several poetry books, and just as a super believer, we ask a blessing all off it. And I want the four there, if you got a tassel, just go ahead. You are now officially graduated. All right. All right. One of the things we've been doing for the last several years is have a scriptural charge. And uh, I got that from Columbia Seminary. It was just phenomenal. And so we've asked Dustin to present that tonight. How's everybody doing? Good. I assure you, this will not take as long as Rufus. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah. This is 
not my charge, it's a charge from the scriptures, so this is God's charge. And I try to find some passages that uh, would encourage the graduates to continue uh, in the work of the Lord, and also to encourage uh, everyone who's here to support them, to encourage them in their work of the Lord. Then when the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altars with tongs, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. When they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you, rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Amen. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. Not for sort of gain, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory, rulership in God's kingdom. Behold, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt necessary to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Amen to that kid. <laughs> Jesus answered, The foremost is this, The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and there's no commandment greater than these. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? There's a table back there, so you don't have to worry. So. <laughs> or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. One last passage here. Rufus talked about dreams and visions. John had a dream and vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. This is my favorite part. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying, Amen. or pain, the first things have passed away. The one who is conquering will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my child. Amen. That is my charge to the graduates. Fifty years ago, the administration of our Bible College decided to create a special award to recognize outstanding performance at our college. This is such a special award that it has only been awarded nine times over those 50 years. Recipients of this award must meet very stringent requirements. The student must have attended the college for at least three academic years carrying a full-time course load each semester.
student must have at least a 3.85 grade point average on a scale of 4.0. The student must have a record of outstanding service and leadership, and the student must be elected to the award by the college administration. This evening, on behalf of the administration of Atlanta Bible College, it is my honor and privilege to present the Silver Disc Award to Jack Commit. It was a great pleasure when we found that Jack was coming to the college. He came to us from the Jane Street Church of God in Omaha, Nebraska. His pastor, Scott Ross, had invested a lot of time and effort in Jack, seeing in him a great potential to be a pastor. Jack went calling with Scott and became very aware of the work of a pastor. After attending the University of Nebraska at Omaha for a year, Jack decided to come to Atlanta Bible College. Jack's academic performance has been excellent. His grade point average is 3.94 on that 4.0 scale. He has been active in many aspects of college life, including serving as the leader of our worship service planning lab for two semesters. Students who take this lab plan the weekly chapel services and lead the music. While a student at Atlanta Bible College, Jack has also been very active in ministry here at the Cornerstone Bible Church. While finishing a few remaining courses at Bible College, Jack has been serving his internship here at Cornerstone during the past nine months. He's been involved in many areas of ministry. He has demonstrated his uh, excellent skills at preaching and teaching. He has become loved by this congregation. As an apartment resident, he has also been a good role model to the other students. There was a unanimous decision that Jack should receive this award. So Jack, can you come forward? speakers, and I assure you, these guys are good. And everyone in the preaching class was, are good. I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. I'm going to ask those on this road to just stand for a moment. I'm going to read to you from the Suffering Servant songs, because this is your mission, and Brother Ruth has talked about a dream, and since you are in Christ, you are his servant also, and being his servant, therefore you're a servant of Almighty God. This is my servant, says Yahweh. I will strengthen him. I will delight in him. He will put his spirit in you. You will not grow weak nor be discouraged until you have your dream. I, Yahweh, have called you for a righteous purpose. I will hold you by your hand and I will keep you and I will appoint you to be a light to the nations. That was Isaiah 42. In Isaiah 49, it continues. The Lord called you before you were born. I believe that for you. I believe that for myself. The Lord called you before you were born. He named you in your mother's wombs. He makes your words sharp. He hides you in the hollow of his hand. He says, you are my servant. And you are now. <coughs> and the Lord will vindicate you. And your reward is your God. That's what it says. My reward is my God. The servant's reward, reward is your God. And your God is your strength. 
And he will answer you in a time of favor. And he will help you in the day of salvation. And he will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant to the nations and a light to the world. That was 49. And recalling Jesus' first sermon out of Isaiah 61, this is for you and me also as servants of Yahweh El Shaddai. The Spirit of the Lord God is on you because the Lord has appointed you and anointed you to bring good news to the poor. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the year of the Lord's vengeance, but to comfort all those who mourn, provide for those in Zion, and give a crown of beauty instead of ashes, and oil instead of mourning, splendid clothes instead of despair. And they and you will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord, a glory to Him. You are His servants. Amen. Amen. We'd like to have the whole congregation stand up and we'll offer the benediction. Please wait as the uh, graduates go out after the prayer. Father God, we come before you in this very special occasion. Father, you have shown us many times you do not need large numbers to save people. You have eight people on the ark. Father, you called an old man of 75 years, Abraham, and his wife and a few servants to start a nation. Father, you know how to use a few folks. Gideon had 30,000. You reduced it down to 300. You know how to use the last, the least, the low, and the lost. Father, we have a super group of young men and women here tonight. We just ask your blessing on them. Father, we pray that you would anoint them with your Holy Spirit, that you would pour out blessings on them. We know, according to your word, by the very word of Jesus in this world, they will have trouble, but Jesus overcame the world, so I pray an overcoming of them. Father, let their dream be the dream that you have for them, and as part of that, to be the, the servant for you, Father. And Father, we just ask you to bless them to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom until you send your son back. Yes. Lord, bless us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.